It was Halloween two days ago. And so since I'm the local speaker, I'm going to take it upon myself to shorten my talk so we can hear from people who have traveled from afar if you want to hear me at you know, from walking distance. Um, can't really see what it says on there. Um, anyway, it's predatory IP law and Canadian innovations. The basic argument is not going to be legal here. I'm just going to assume that IP law is in, in many ways a black box. And what I want to look at is really the ability of local, national, or subnational actors uh, to shape IP law in order to promote innovation. And the effect of the importation or imposition of IP law norms that come from the outside and its uh, effect on innovation locally. So there are lots of other questions I'm not addressing, such as the effects on developing countries uh, uh, of what we do in Canada. I'm really looking at Canada or Israel and asking the question, how do we think about international IP standards and what does that mean to us? So the basic argument is that at a very fundamental level, IP law does good things and it does bad things poses cost and it provides some benefits. Empirically, we're not sure exactly what those are, hugely in dispute. We know they do both. The uh, economic theory is pretty clear about that. Uh, from a social point of view, we can, uh, as Professor Gellert pointed out, we can look at many examples of both benefits and of cost. But quantifying these uh, is very difficult. We also know that countries differ in terms of their infrastructures, their assets, their human capital, uh, the education level, the receptivity of consumers to different products, the ability to find people to market your good, complementary assets, access to money, access to different markets, both nationally and internationally. So each country is quite different. Canada does not look like Israel, which is why we should not just take Israel's solutions and import them. They probably couldn't even work in Israel today. And they evolved over a long period of time, mostly during a time when no one cared about innovation at, you know, as an individual, it wasn't in the press as much, and so you can get away with a whole lot then that you can't now. But also, Israel has changed. So we need to think about how do we get the right balance at each, within each country. And the one thing we can say is one size does not fit all. Blindly following some claimed international norm is destructive. It just cannot possibly uh, suit local needs. And we see the example of this in uh, Eli Lilly's attempt to enforce a certain vision of patent law on Canada through, the, through NAFTA and its investor state dispute resolution. In fact, next Tuesday, the Supreme Court of Canada for the first time will be addressing the, the, the patent law issues underlying that. Now, my argument is that that is the right place to make decisions, Supreme Court of Canada. It is not the place under an investor state dispute resolution on the assumption there is some international norm. Factually, there is none, uh, and the argument, you know, if you talk to anybody who's not associated with uh, the industry, uh, nobody actually believes that it literally has a chance because there is no norm. Uh, but yet, Canada is susceptible uh, to this argument uh, in, in the absence of any innovation strategy. We know that we've never had one. We have a government that is claiming to put to be creating an innovation strategy, but I think Keith's question earlier on um, raised question marks about, well, what do they even mean by it? So far, it seems to be a research strategy, not tons that we're hearing on an innovation strategy. So in a situation like that, we're particularly susceptible to arguments of this is the international norm and we have to follow it. As I said, the oh, Every system, every regulatory system IP is no different, has benefits and costs. Usually we assume that those benefits and costs will find an equilibrium within a country because the country 
the country's laws provide both the benefit and the cost. And if you look at the United States law on intellectual property, not what it tries to impose on other people, but what it does internally, it's extremely well balanced. Right? The rights that are given to rights holders uh, is balanced against rights given to users. Uh, there are all kinds of exceptions uh, in the act. States are exempt from it. I mean, there are massive holes in U.S. law specifically designed to allow the state to do things. Uh, things that we don't do in Canada, it's all built into their intellectual property laws. It's not what they say externally, right? They, they forget the balancing part when they go externally and just go for um, one part of it, and I'll come back to that. So when you have a market that both produces innovation and consumes the innovation, we should hit this equilibrium, at least on the economic side. I'll leave aside the social side, although there is more room for it uh, when the same state is suffering from it. But what happens when the cost and benefits are, are, are occur in different places? where one state's laws provide the benefit and another state's laws provide the costs. You're not going to therefore hit a natural equilibrium because in, unless these states are mutually modifying each other constantly so as to create effectively one market, which doesn't happen, there'll be factors that will happen in one country that will be the benefits to go up or down and in the other country costs, and there's no reason to believe that those will balance that. I'll come back to that point. Let's just look at Canada. So these are innovative companies. This is by Price Waterhouse. They did a study uh, that came out last year looking at emerging Canadian tech companies and asking where their money comes from. So most of the money comes from Canada. A uh, little bit comes from outside Canada, the United States, and then the second most significant part, 32% comes from the US. That's the part that's rising. Okay, so you're a Canadian policymaker and you're saying we want innovative companies. We want companies like this to do well. If they're surviving on 59% of their, of their revenues coming from Canada, they're not going to succeed. We're just too small a market, right? Except for snowblowers and some other things where we're significant markets. We are insignificant for most technology. So if you think that the end goal is to sell your software in Canada, you're missing out on 98% of the market. If you're selling pharmaceutical products, you're missing out on that same. So this is a problem that we're focusing internally. Luckily, the U.S. part is going up, but look at the rest of the world and perhaps that some of these impetus for CETA would be if we actually had an innovation strategy. Um, so let's look at Canada again, and this could go for any small country, but we're in a particular situation. We've got this huge, the biggest market in the world sitting uh, south of the border. And if you're a Canadian firm and we want Canadian firms to go international, then the drive for scaling up from pretty low scale companies, small companies, to big international brands, frankly, if you want to make, if you want to drive employment, which seems to be the underlying policy here, that's the only way you're going to do it. Then it's the US market, and therefore US laws, that provide the benefit. So Canadian firms need access to US intellectual property laws, but not only that, the regulatory laws uh, in terms of plants, in terms of uh, drugs, and so on. But it's U.S. law that provides the incentive. And that incentive is balanced out in the United States against other factors that make sense in the U.S. market but don't affect the Canadian producer. But the cost of IP, that is the cost on innovation, comes from Canadian IP law. Why? Because the research I do here, the people I hire here to do work, are subject not to U.S. patent law or copyright law, but to Canadian copyright law and patent law. And therefore, you know, one could argue that having zero intellectual property law is in the best interest of Canada. Why? Because our innovators don't have to pay for anything. What are these costs? They're transaction costs, identifying who are the IP owners. 
try to negotiate a license with them. They may or may not give it, the cost of the license. And we talked about universities in the previous panel. This is a major issue. Universities getting IP just plods it up even further. And so the Canadian uh, IP law, as I said, is imposing the cost on innovation, especially the cost of scaling up. So, now, as I said, our policy, uh, long-term policy, and I view this is a government, federal government department, is trying to assist Canadian firms to scale up to be international brands to selling internationally. And they identify, I'm paraphrasing them, but a few different things. Uh, they're focusing on SMEs, and we can have a talk about whether SMEs are the proper focus. There's not entirely clear. In fact, most jobs are, prevent, are created by large firms, not SMEs. SMEs create the most, but they also lose the most. The net balance is for big firms, but I'll put that aside. What do they need? Well, they need to, before they go global, the stage that my little pie chart before had was they need access to financing, but they also need access to complementary assets. How do you get through a regulatory process? How do you uh, market your good? How do you find other goods that have to be sold with it? I mean, think about containers that we use to ship things around the world, right? You come up with a container, it's a great idea. It has no value unless the trucks are made to carry it. It's not my argument, this is David Tisa's argument. Uh, you have shipping that can carry it, you have rail cars that can carry it, you have rail rails themselves that are strong enough to carry it. So we need to connect up our innovation ecosystem to be able to do that. That's what we need to do. We have to have the right regulatory regimes. If it's too lax, then we're not going to be able to go global. If it's too harsh, we won't be able to start out. Notice here, it's not clear that intellectual property <coughs> is a major player, a uh, major factor here. Uh, because at this point, when you're just scaling up, there is at least Canadian intellectual property law. Yeah, there's a possibility to start up, someone else looks at you and starts it up in Canada, but frankly, until you've proven that this is a worthwhile area, not so clear. They're gonna wait for you to prove that you have something. And then you need policies to go global. But again, it's IP law, but not our IP law. It's knowing how do you get into US IP law. It's how to manipulate regulations, not in Canada, but internationally. So one of the things that Jim Balsilli did when he uh, was working, when he was the head of uh, research in motion, was go to Brussels and go to other places to make sure that he had a voice in standard setting about how things communicate. Canadians don't do that. Our government doesn't belong to these things. But that's what's essential, right? How do we get the Canadian technology to be the standard, or at least compliant with it early on, rather than after we develop our product having to redesign it to comply with some foreign standard? It's finding partners abroad. So this is what Israel did in its early days, right? It partnered Israeli firms with US firms to be able to better understand the US market. It wasn't about IP law. Israel's IP laws are, you know, sort of middle of the ground, in fact, not nearly as protective as the United States, uh, but balanced for its interests. But it concentrated on making the links. Uh, we don't. We have zero policy. What we do have is a bunch of US firms coming to Canada and telling us that we're out of step with the rest of the world and lobbying our government. Canadian firms don't do this. Canadian firms don't even lobby our government, let alone foreign government. So during the TPP negotiations, you had every single big name tech company you can think of. You had the pharmaceutical industry all lobbying Ottawa directly or indirectly, and not a peep from Shopify and all the other smaller firms that were hoping to go global. And what are the US firms saying? Well, they don't care about the balance in Canada, right? They care about the balance in the United States so that it works for them. But when they enter our market, they're not entering us to drive an innovation system. They're coming into our, to our markets to sell a product. And for them, impeding our innovation system is actually good for them. So getting us to accept a higher level of intellectual property law allows them to block innovation locally. 
and that allows them to access the Canadian markets and extract the maximum amount of rents. That is the policy of the U.S. government when it negotiates, because it's a smart, it has, it actually does innovation policy. It doesn't call it that, but it knows what it's doing. Right? If you look at TPP, someone did a textual analysis, about 80% of it corresponds to exactly what the United States had asked for. And that's not an accident. The United States knows what it's doing, and it doesn't care about building up our innovation market, as I said. It cares about extracting rents from us. But in the absence of knowing what we're doing here, and what are the constituent parts of an innovation policy, and what we need, what kind of partnerships we need, and what kind of technology we want, and what kind of country we want, these arguments, uh, you know, hold water. We had our minister of uh, whatever that ministry is now, formerly known as industry. Uh, I said, uh, you know, he said, you know, we're the what, number 10, 10 biggest uh, market for pharmaceutical drugs. Isn't this great? No, it's not great. What it means is we're paying way too much. We pay the second or third highest drug costs in the world. Other countries are smart enough to tie the cost of drugs to kind of, you know, investments. We don't. Um, so we don't have much of a sense of uh, policy, and so we cannot evaluate these things. It's not that IP is good or IP is bad. It's a tool. It can be good or bad. But we have no context in which to evaluate particular claims. And so the benefits, it's those who are IP rights holders. And we don't have very many of those. IP rights, you know, the Canadian success story is we fund a university that does research, comes up with a great idea, and it patents it. Can't really find anybody who wants it, so it spins out a company and gets public financing to do so. It then develops the product some more. Suddenly, one out of a hundred of these companies actually gets something and has no access to complementary assets, that either not to markets or something's missing. So it sells that to a U.S. company. That U.S. company pays very low amount, or relatively low amount, because there's no market that's created. They then create the market, they make the money, and they sell it back to us, and we pay again through these fees. That's the Canadian model of innovation. Um, and that's what it does to us, right? We're wearing an IP model, not that IP is good or bad. I want to move away from that. I think we get into this rhetoric of either pro-IP or against IP. We're right, we're for the right IP for the right country. And having you know, an IP system that doesn't fit doesn't do us any good and risks putting us in a straitjacket. So if we think about the TPP or CEDA, the claims asked, the things asked for by Europe and the United States are not so wrong, but if we don't understand how they restrict our ability to shape our national policy, then they cause harm. So it's the absence of an innovation policy, a real one, not a research policy, that makes us susceptible to these claims. So I will end there.